Good evening. I'm Jake Ward in for Gotti Schwartz tonight. Hamas has released two American hostages nearly two weeks after they were taken. Not too long ago, Hamas's Al Qassam brigades released video of the moment the pair was released. Have a look. Their names are Judith Ty Renan and Natalie Shoshana Renan, a mother and daughter who live in the Chicago area. Both women were met at the Gaza border by Israeli military before being taken to an Israeli army base where they were reunited with their family. It is not yet clear what condition they're in or when they will be heading back to the United States, although we are hoping to learn more about that this evening. What we do know is that they were both kidnapped while visiting a kibbutz two Saturdays ago. Hamas is still holding 10 other Americans hostage, according to the State Department. President Biden released a statement saying in part, quote, we have been working around the clock to free American citizens who were taken hostage by Hamas, and we have not ceased our efforts to secure the release of those who are still being held. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Hala Garani from Tel Aviv. Hala, thank you for being here. We just saw the video of the release. You can see Red Cross facilitators pictured in the images we've seen. What else do we know about how the release came about today? So it came about uh, through mediation that the Qatari government facilitated. Uh, it uh, hosts Hamas in Doha. It does also send money to the Gaza Strip, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So it has a lot of influence over Hamas. Uh, it was able to secure the release of these two American hostages. Uh, these were discussions that took place uh, with uh, Hamas acting as a mediator with Israel on one side and Hamas on on the other, uh, the hope now is, of course, that this will lead to more civilian hostage, uh, uh, to more to the release of more civilian hostages. Hamas is saying that it's open to the idea of quote closing the civilian file if, and I want to uh, uh, quote them uh, correctly, if appropriate security conditions allow. It's unclear exactly what that means. Uh, I think we have to be uh, careful about hoping for a mass release of civilian hostages. These are bargaining chips for the group inside of Gaza. Uh, the fact that they released two American hostages is rather significant as well. A Hamas spokesperson was quoted as saying that it's to prove to the American people and the world that the claims made by the Biden administration are false and baseless. Mm. So this is what we know so far. As far as the condition of the hostages, we've seen a still photograph and we've seen that video that you just showed our viewers. Uh, uh, filmed by Hamas and released by the Qassam Brigades, which is the armed military wing of the group inside of Gaza. They are walking. Uh, they seem to be able to stand and walk on their own. So there is no suggestion that their condition is dire, though we don't know, obviously, medically, whether there's anything wrong with them. Um, but this is so far what we know about the, the release of the hostages. And there's still so many outstanding questions whether or not this will have an impact on Israel's planned incursion yes. into the Strip. Jake. Well, I'm wondering in the short term, Hala, has Israeli intelligence, do you think, interviewed this pair, right? They, they were taken to an Israeli military base. Presumably there is a chance to get mm -hmm. info perhaps on the whereabouts of the other hostages. Certainly, I don't have information to confirm it, but it is standard operating procedure to debrief hostages once they've been released. Where were you held? Maybe even if they don't know where other hostages are being held, the fact that they can describe where they were. Was it a tunnel? Was it a safe house? Uh, was it somewhere else? Yeah. It might give some clues to authorities there as to where to look for the others. Um, but, you know, this is presumably not information that even if they are in the possession of, that they'll be sharing with us publicly. But it's something that they're going to have to use strategically to try to get to the remaining hostages. You mentioned this very complicated relationship with the Qatari government, and I'm curious how that might play into negotiations for, for the other 200 hostages, right? This is just two of hundreds of people still mm -hmm. being held captive. Does IDF Sure. say whether it believes those hostages are still alive and do you think there are any improved prospects for their release?
So the, the Israeli military is saying that it believes a, a majority, a majority of hostages are alive, which is which obviously is great news for the families and the loved ones uh, of the people detained in Gaza. Uh, though Hamas, you'll remember early on, said that several of the hostages had been killed in the bombing campaign that Israel is waging in Gaza. So really, absolutely very difficult times for the family and loved ones of these hostages. Um, as far as the Israeli military is concerned, it is still, and the government of Benjamin Netanyahu, it is still saying that it is not this release and the fact that hostages are still detained is not going to have a major impact on its planned military operation so far, Jake. Hala Garani for us in Tel Aviv tonight. Hala, thank you so much. Now, while the situation surrounding other hostages remains unclear, as Hala mentioned, the State Department says Hamas is holding nearly a dozen more Americans. NBC's Andrew Mitchell has more on the complicated diplomatic work currently underway to get them home safely. Tonight, the urgent push to get all the hostages released from Gaza. They include men, women, young boys, young girls, elderly people from many nations. Secretary of State Tony Blinken now saying the focus is on the 10 additional Americans who remain unaccounted for, along with around 200 others. The urgent work to free every single American, to free all other hostages, continues. Working with Qatar and other countries he visited last week, shuttling around the Mideast, pressing them to use their connections to Hamas to get the hostages out. The freed Americans, Judith and Natalie Renan, once they've gotten medical treatment, will be invaluable sources for how the remaining hostages are being treated and held. NBC's David Road was held hostage for seven months by the Taliban in 2008 before getting out in a daring escape. Israeli officials will talk immediately to this mother and daughter and try to get a sense of where they were held, how many other captives were held uh, with them, and just get a sense of, of what Hamas is doing with all of these captives. Is there any way to find them? Is there any way to rescue them? It's a much bigger issue now, hostage taking, for civilians, for the hostages themselves, and for governments. And there has to be a more unified effort with the U.S. and its allies in the Middle East, its allies in Europe, to how to stop this kidnapping from happening. The U.S. does not trust the terror group's promises, but Hamas has said it will release all the non-military hostages if Israel halts the airstrikes. Should even the airstrikes be stopped to see if you could get more people out? It's very simple. Um, hostages should be released immediately and unconditionally. Andrew Mitchell for us tonight. Andrew, thank you. Meanwhile, with an estimated 350 Palestinian Americans still trapped in Gaza, Israeli airstrikes on Gaza seem to have intensified since President Joe Biden left the region. The Israeli Defense Force released footage today showing attacks against what they say are Hamas targets, claiming to have hit more than 100 overnight, including underground tunnels and operational headquarters. Also overnight, there was also an explosion at Gaza's oldest Greek Orthodox church, causing it to collapse. One of the church's members says around 500 people, both Christians and Muslims, were sheltering inside for days. But fewer than that were said to be inside at the time of the blast. Hamas says at least 18 people were killed there. They came here to escape the airstrikes and the destruction. They thought they were safe here. The destruction followed them. The destruction followed them. Former U.S. Representative Justin Amash confirmed on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, that several of his relatives who were sheltering there were killed. Amash was the first Palestinian to serve in the U.S. Congress. The Israeli military says they were conducting operations near the church, but they deny targeting it directly. NBC's Ellison Barber joins us now live from Tel Aviv. Ellison, thank you for being here. What can you tell us about those overnight strikes in Gaza? Israel says they hit 100 targets. Is that correct? Yeah, they're saying that they hit 100 targets in the overnight hours. It's now the overnight hours again here. But those strikes that picked up again last night, there had been a bit of a pause over 10 hours worth of kind of a halt, not fully, but a bit of a lull in airstrikes. And since then, in the overnight hours this morning in throughout today, we have just seen an escalation return of airstrikes going into Gaza and also headed towards Israel. Those areas that you 
were mentioning so well, uh, Israel is adamant that what they were targeting in those strikes were areas where Hamas was operating, command centers, places where they stored munitions. But there were, as we know from our teams inside of Gaza, civilians in that area. Mm -hmm. Israel also fired a number of missiles towards the southern part of Gaza. And remember, that is an area where they had told people to evacuate to seek safety. And that's been one of the things that we've spoken to people inside of Gaza that they have talked about, how they say, yeah, they're telling us to to go to the south, but then we keep seeing airstrikes happening in that area. And because of that, we feel like nowhere inside of Gaza is safe. And even if we have somewhere else to evacuate or we're considering it, we're afraid of what could happen when we get further south because airstrikes are still happening there. I also want to tell you, Jake, uh, President Biden was just on his way to boarding Air Force One and reporters there asked him a couple of questions. And one of them, based on the notes we have here from the team of reporters traveling with him, one reporter asked him if they if he wants Israel to delay its ground offensive to see if more hostages will be released. He gave a one word answer saying yes. That's pretty significant because in the past, when there were discussions with Secretary of State Antony Blinken and others as they visited Israel, there was this question as to whether or not the United States is asking Israel to do anything differently in terms of their military plans, if they were waiting to get Americans out of Gaza who were Palestinian Americans, or if they were waiting to try and get hostages out. And Secretary of State Blinken and others had been adamant in saying they had not made any requests or asks of Israel in terms of their military plans. But now, this from President Biden, when he was asked if he wants Israel to delay its ground offensive until more hostages are released, his answer this evening Yes. Jake. So, Ellison, against the backdrop of that answer from the president, the fact, as you told us last night, that at 350 Palestinian Americans plus 400 family members are still in Gaza with no clear way out, and as you just mentioned, no place is safe, seemingly, does the release of these hostages and the threat of a greater regional conflict, do you think, affect Israel's ground invasion plans at all? Do you have a sense of that? You know, it's, it's really hard to know right now. We've heard this language from Israeli officials, Israeli military, really sense that terror attack on October 7th, where they talk about the fact that this war will escalate, that they do plan to have a ground offensive. Just yesterday, Israel's defense minister told troops at the Gaza border, you've seen Gaza from the outside, soon you will see it from the inside. But there has always been this situation inside of Gaza where it's not just U.S. citizens, but also French citizens, other countries uh, in Europe, other countries in the Balkan areas. I mean, mm. lots of different people there with dual citizenships who are stuck inside of Gaza. And because that Rafa border crossing, the sole land crossing into Egypt, has not opened for humanitarian aid, much less people leaving, there's been this question of will they have pressure from the outside community from partners like the United States, from other close allies to hold off to see if they can get some of their citizens out of Gaza first. And there's been a lot of dancing around on that question when we've asked IDF spokespeople of that. Uh, but it certainly seems like that would be a discussion going on behind closed doors because there's a desperate urge from other nations to get their citizens out of Gaza. And so far, they haven't had the chance to leave because there's a full blockade uh, on the Israeli border. Yeah. And that Rafa crossing, it has been closed consistently throughout this. Jake? Now, Ellison, you know, it has, as you say, been so difficult to see inside Israel's plans here or get any sense of, of whether these events are, are making a difference. I mean, Israel's defense minister has been sort of as close to a, a way of taking the temperature as we've, as we've found, right? But he's made some interesting comments today. He said the last phase of Israel's plan to take out Hamas is, quote, the removal of Israel's responsibility for life in the Gaza Strip. I have to say those are very startling words, and I wonder how you interpret his meaning. Yeah, you know, there's one read of that, and I tried to go back and see if he said anything else around that time to just give a little more context to what he meant there. But the general read on that is the belief is that he's addressing questions about after this ground assault, after if Israel does what it says it's going to do, which is completely strip Hamas of any military and governing capabilities inside of Gaza, then what? Is Israel going to go in and have Israeli forces occupying inside of Gaza like they did in 2005? Or are they going to support someone else coming in and governing? I think his 
statement on that is alluding to this question of will Israel actually establish a presence inside of Gaza again after this is over if they are successful in what they say their goal is, which is to get rid of Hamas entirely. And I think he is alluding to that, saying no, Israel doesn't have plans to reoccupy inside of Gaza. But then there are still all these open-ended questions of but what would that look like? Because the Israel provides power prior to October 7th into Gaza. They, by the U.N., are considered to be occupying Gaza and therefore technically responsible for the civilians inside of it. Israel, Israelis and Israeli leaders will tell you, we haven't been inside of Gaza since 2005. And it's technically true. They pulled out in 2005. There was an election in 2006. Hamas won it. Then there was this bit of an internal war between Fatah and Hamas. Hamas seizes power outright in 2007. So Israelis will say, we haven't been inside of Gaza since 2005. We don't control it. But the mm. truth is, they never really left. And this is the argument Palestinians will make because they just surrounded the entire outside of it. And that's why people describe it as an open air prison. Right. So I think he's saying we won't physically go back inside of Gaza. But does that mean they'll actually let Gaza elect its own government mm. again? And will they say, OK, you've elected them and we support it. We'll leave you be. Will they support a two state solution? Yeah. I think there's just not a lot there other than him saying, I promise we won't reoccupy inside of Gaza, but I don't know what that means for the Palestinian people. It Jason. is so hard for us to decode uh, the meaning of these uh, phrases and these uh, events from so many thousands of miles away, and that's why we're so grateful that you are up all night there on the ground for us. Ellison Barber in Tel Aviv, thank you so much. All right, our coverage of the Israel-Hamas war continues next. Two weeks into this war, demonstrations are growing louder, not just overseas, but right here in the United States as well. More on that up next. Outside of Gaza, tensions in the region are only growing after an explosion at a Gaza hospital killed hundreds of people. Since Wednesday, there's been a number of drone attacks on U.S. bases throughout the Middle East. NBC's Courtney Cuby has the latest. Jake, there's been a real uptick in activity by Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria targeting bases housing U.S. and coalition forces. It all started Wednesday when we, we learned about two drones that attempted to attack and target al-Assad Air Base in western Iraq. Both were shot down, but as one of them fell to the ground and broke into pieces, it struck a hangar, injuring a number of U.S. personnel inside. The injuries were minor, mainly lacerations, but there were injuries involved. Another drone attempted to strike at a U.S. military facility in northern Iraq, but it was successfully shot down. Then, only yesterday, we learned about two more drones that attempted to strike on Atanf, which is a, a U.S. military garrison in southern Syria. One was shot down, but the other one was not. It was actually able to target the base, and several personnel were injured. Now, this is a real uptick in the number of, the, the, of these types of activities that we really haven't seen in recent months in either Iraq or, or Syria. Then there was something that we have not seen in, in even longer time, in even much greater time, Jake, and that was a U.S. Navy destroyer shot down four land attack cruise missiles and a number of drones, more than a dozen drones that were flying nearby. It was what the U.S. military called an act of self-defense because they could have been threatening to the ship that was in the Northern Red Sea at the time. Now, later on, we heard from Brigadier General Pat Ryder, the press secretary here at the Pentagon, saying that they believe those missiles and those drones may have been fired from the Houthis and may have even been targeted into Israel. Now, of course, the ship was in the Northern Red Sea and was able to intercept them before they hit into Israel. That is something that we have never seen. The Houthis at attempting to fire missiles and drones all the way up into Israel. The big question now is, has there been, is this, this new increase in this sort of activity, is this something that may be related to Gaza? Well, U.S. officials are saying they don't have any direct link between the two. But a senior Israeli official who I spoke with late today said that, in fact, they do believe there, that, that there is no way that the Houthis would have tried to target Israel without a green light from Iran. Jake? NBC's Courtney QB. Courtney, thank you so much. Mass protests continue to pop up around the world tonight. From Iraq to Malaysia, thousands of protesters held demonstrations outside of U.S. embassies in support of the Palestinian people. Here this, here's the scene, for instance, from Indonesia, where some protesters even burned portraits of President Biden.
And security is still a concern here at home, too. On Capitol Hill, there's an increased police presence because of expected demonstrations through at least next Wednesday. Earlier, protesters in D.C. reacted to the release of American hostages. I hope this means a ceasefire as well within our sites. It should have happened days ago, weeks ago. It should have never come to this point. Uh, so I hope that this is a sign that, uh, that the people in power have uh, come to their senses and will stop this genocide and ceasefire now. Or let's go to NBC's Ryan Nobles in Washington. Jake, obviously any type of security threat is something that is taken very seriously here at the Capitol, especially after everything that happened on January 6th. And this situation is really no different. Uh, Capitol Police have an increased security posture. They have uh, put more security barriers around the Capitol complex, including bike racks uh, all around the Capitol uh, campus itself. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, a fair number of demonstrations happening in and around Capitol Hill. There was, of course, a group of protesters that gained access uh, to the Cannon office building just a couple of days ago, and more than 300 of those protesters were arrested. But it's important to point out that uh, all of these protests have been, for the most part, peaceful. Uh, we've seen many protests gather on the National Mall as well, which is just a stone's throw from where we are here on Capitol Hill. So it's something Capitol Police is monitoring. It's not necessarily something that they're overly concerned about. They do believe they have the proper protocols in place. Their intelligence gathering is much better than it was leading up to January 6th. But like state houses across the country, government buildings across the country, and all sorts of different public places, everyone is taking the situation seriously and the possible threat seriously because this is of course an uncertain time jake nbc's ryan nobles ryan thank you coming up the images that we're seeing out of israel and gaza are not easy to look at honestly they can be pretty traumatizing well next a psychiatrist will explain the impact it's having on many of us and how we can protect ourselves and our children please stay with us It was a shocking development, but again, to remind you, two American hostages were released by Hamas today. Judith and Natalie Renan were taken captive from their kibbutz in southern Israel on October 7th. Here again is that footage shot by Hamas of them being released. They were later reunited with family and spoke with President Biden by phone. I'd like to go now to NBC's Maggie Vespa. She's in Bannockburn, Illinois, just outside Chicago, Judith and Natalie Renan's hometown. Maggie, thank you for being here. I understand the family is, is preparing to speak shortly. Yeah, Jake, exactly. So as you know, we were in Evanston earlier, another Chicago suburb. We were talking to the family's rabbi who told us that he's overwhelmed, overjoyed, all of those kind of uh, just, you know, emotions running high. Everybody's processing this in real time. But you're right. We drove about half an hour north of Chicago because basically Natalie's father is getting ready to give a statement to reporters uh, basically in the next half hour or so. It would be the first time that we heard directly from a close family member, one this close anyway, uh, since this announcement was made. And this revelation came to light earlier today that Natalie and Judith had indeed been freed by Hamas. But, you know, it's really interesting, Jake, as you know, our NBC News family has a bizarre connection to this. As it turns out, Judith and Natalie are related to longtime war correspondent, longtime Israel-based correspondent with NBC News, Martin Fletcher. Uh, he revealed last night on MSNBC that they are his relatives. Cut to less than 24 hours later, Natalie and Judith are, as we said again, released. And this is what Martin had to say earlier today to NBC News about how relatives, especially those in Israel, are reacting to this news. Take a listen. The cousin told me it, we're shocked. It's happy. It's unbelievable. We're celebrating. I said, how much are you drinking? And they said, we're not celebrating too much yet because we don't know what condition um, their, their family members are in. Are they, are they hurt? They don't know. So they're not celebrating yet, but they're getting ready to celebrate. They're certainly celebrating that they're alive. Martin's dry humor for a little bit there with that how much you drink in comment, but that it's met with that trepidation. And we've been hearing that from people throughout the day. There's just still so much people don't know. How are Natalie and Judith? What were the conditions like when they were being held by Hamas? Were they even allowed to be together uh, during this time when they were in captivity, when they were being held hostage? So again, we're all, you can see the reporters behind me here, we're all waiting to hear from Natalie's dad in the next half hour about what he's heard since they've been released and then just any plans or hopes, Jake, 
on a reunion soon. So we'll keep you posted. And Maggie, for you know, all of us sitting at such a great distance from Israel and Gaza, trying to wrap our minds around the abstract right. horror of this is one thing. But you are actually talking to people whose community have been directly affected. And I, I just wonder what it is like to go and speak to people, try to strike up conversation about their feelings. What is it like to be with those people tonight? You know, it, again, it was it was really heavy, and I think actually Martin's soundbite there kind of encapsulates a lot of the sort of duality of emotions right now. People are overjoyed, they're elated, they feel like they're going to have, um, they, they have a lot of, a huge sense of relief tonight, but obviously, again, there's so much concern still, and, and we also spoke uh, earlier today, I mentioned earlier we were in Evanston speaking to the family's rabbi, and he was very quick to say again, everybody in the community just breathing this massive sigh of relief. It's rippling through um, the community and those who know and love Natalie and Judith, but also very concerned, again, about their condition and about the situation that remains over in Gaza. So take a listen to what he had to say uh, earlier tonight. Judith and Natalie are the sweetest, kindest people you will meet. They are generous and giving. Judith is the kind of person who always would run over to do something, to be here when someone needed her. We do hope and pray that they will be treated and come back to their health completely and that we'll be able to be with them. And, you know, one note that the rabbi made a couple of times, we found it really interesting. We asked him if he knew anything at this point about the condition of Natalie and Judith. And he said, you know, nothing concrete. He really wanted to respect the family's right to that information and to divulge it as they see fit. But he said one thing that's really concerning people is the idea that they were released uh, per Hamas's statement on humanitarian grounds. And he says that concerns us that maybe they're not in good health. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we were also really cognizant that this comes less than 24 hours after the spotlight on these two hostages grew exponentially. Because, again, Martin pointing to them, saying they are uh, my relatives, my American relatives, talking about that on live television. And so basically we asked the rabbi, you know, do you think that this was truly a humanitarian release? Do you think that it has anything to do with that revelation that happened on live television? And the rabbi just simply said, I think our prayers have been answered. Mm. Jake. Maggie Vespa with the family tonight, and here's hoping that those two are reunited with that family and with the congregation. Maggie, thank you so much. Britain's prime minister met with the president of the Palestinian Authority in Egypt today, where there was talk about supporting a two-state solution. Now, that goal might seem impossible right now, but nearly 30 years ago, the idea seemed very much within reach. NBC's Raf Sanchez has more. As Israel and Hamas descend further into war, the prospects for a broader Israeli-Palestinian peace deal seem further away than ever. But 30 years ago, that peace appearing on the cusp after decades of conflict. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Neighboring Arab states launching a war against Israel after it was founded. The international community envisioning a Palestinian state, too. But Israel fighting with Arab countries in conflicts like the Six-Day War and Yom Kippur War, alongside clashes with Palestinians, preventing that state from fully emerging. One of Israel's fiercest soldiers in those years, Itzhak Rabin, growing into a warrior of peace after being re-elected prime minister in 1992. Rabin spent many years in the Israeli Defense Forces. He knew the cost of war better than most. Rabin opening a door to negotiations with Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO. At that time, the PLO designated a terrorist group by the United States and a tumultuous Palestinian uprising called the First Intifada in full swing. After months of preliminary talks, Rabin reluctantly met Arafat in Washington. Bill Clinton had to coach him along and say, I know this isn't easy. I know this has been your enemy for a long, long time, but here's our opportunity uh, and we should grab it. The two once bitter adversaries shaking hands and their governments signing the Oslo Accord. Enough of blood and tears. Enough. The difficult decision we reached together was one that required great and exceptional courage. The PLO would recognize Israel's right to exist, and Israel would begin transitioning control of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank to Palestinians. The deal, just the beginning for Rabin. Israel signed a peace treaty with Jordan in 1994, 
and another Oslo Accord with Arafat in 1995. What could be the most promising step yet toward peace in the Arab lands that Israel has occupied since the 1967 war. That November, Rabin speaking at a giant rally for peace in Tel Aviv. But just as he left the stage, tragedy. Four or five shots rang out and Rabin collapsed into the arms of his security men. Rabin killed, not by a Palestinian, but by a 24-year-old Israeli extremist who opposed the peace process. A blood-stained paper found in his jacket pocket. On it, lyrics of Shir La Shalom, or a song for peace. <laughs> One he sang on stage just moments before his death. In the days following, a national moment of silence. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, the city of Jerusalem ground to a halt. Rabin's death shocking the world. The world has lost one of its greatest men, a warrior for his nation's freedom, and now a martyr for his nation's peace. Very shocking for this awful and terrible crime. The fallout of that traumatic loss inflaming hardliners on both sides of the conflict. Rabin's assassination was a tremendous blow to the peace process. Israel soon drifting rightward in the vacuum of a strong leader pushing for peace. You had Israelis who had profound doubts about the wisdom of negotiating with the PLO. And Bibi Netanyahu was at the forefront of those with those doubts. Netanyahu coming to power for the first time in 1996. Violence soon flared back up. Bus bombings as part of two more intifadas that killed thousands, Israeli settlement construction ramping up, more peace proposals falling flat, a blockade of Gaza, and now another war. But when this war someday ends, perhaps a new generation of leaders will look back at this moment, recognize how close peace felt, and be inspired by some of Rabin's last words. In every central square of every city, scream out and cheer, only for peace. We cannot understand the news unless we understand the history, and so we're very grateful to Ralph Sanchez for that. Now, for the last two weeks or so, painful and shocking images of war have been hard to avoid. Images showing pain, destruction, and horror. On television, you can flip the channel or turn it off altogether, but on this, on your phone, the endless scrolling can really have an impact on your mind and your psychology. If you are like me, you have felt it. Let's bring in Dr. Sue Verma. She is a board-certified psychiatrist, and she's author of, fourth, of the forthcoming Practical Optimism, the Art, Science, and Practice of Exceptional Well-Being. Dr. Verma, these are dark times, and I'm wondering what you think the, imp the biggest impact is of seeing these images over and over again on all our minds. Yes. So, you know, repeated exposure to graphic, stressful, violent images can produce anxiety, depression, and a feeling of helplessness, um, not to mention anger, frustration, um, and just feeling like we're very conflicted and, and passive as a result. And I feel like when I talk to my patients, the helplessness feels so profound. And for different people, helplessness can manifest in different ways. Some people may tend to turn to substances. Some people are doom scrolling, so they continue to look for um, uh, violent images. Some people um, turn to cyberbullying because they feel so angry and they need to lash out on somebody and they don't know where to take it out. Um, so it's, it's these are very challenging times indeed for a lot of people, even if we're so far away. You know, it is also just so casual at the moment. I was speaking earlier with a technology company that tracks the behavior of young people uh, online, and they were showing me how quickly a child can go from one innocent YouTube search for something entertaining to maybe something educational about Israel to something absolutely unwatchable within a span of a few minutes and then go back to business as usual. I'm wondering what you think the impact is of this sort of casual exposure, especially on the developing brain. Yeah, so, you know, the casual exposure can be dangerous because if uh, a young child doesn't have the context around it and they they don't necessarily even have the language to be able to express what they're going through. Mm. And at the same time, they're watching these images and they're thinking that this could be happening to me. Like they don't have the context of, OK, this is not exactly in, in my neighborhood, but it feels so real. Um, 
And this sort of 24 hour, 24 seven exposure, it's not like we have to go out to get it. It's coming to us, as you said. Um, and the other thing is that casual exposure also causes numbness and desensitization. Um, it's a form of what we call cyber overload or digital overload when the brain is hit with so much information, even if the information isn't violent, but just constant news coming to us. Um, our brain wants to shut down and it shuts down by saying, you know what, I don't really care. There's nothing mm. I can do about it. And and that's the last thing that we want. We want to be able to have some sort of a healthy balance between what I say, my patients often say, do I want to be happy or do I want to be informed? Because mm. it seems like we can't be happy and informed at the same time, unfortunately. I, I feel like there's something so important in the contrast also between, you know, happiness and informed when it comes to, to it really being important to inform people with the most jarring yes. images, right? I mean, back when we first saw images of, of war during Vietnam, for instance, right, it shaped our perception of that conflict. It was utterly shocking to see those images. But now, with social media and with smartphones, it seems like something has changed. And I wonder what you think, you know, obviously there's this individual effect, but what is the sort of social effect, you think, of becoming desensitized as it seems we're being? Yeah, lack of empathy is what's happening, is that when we feel so passive, helpless, angry about things that, um, you know, whether they're close to home or far from home, um, we end up becoming more passive, right? And so sometimes we think that, like, putting comments online, why they are very helpful and can be educating some people, a lot of the comments, unfortunately, are negative or angry and hostile yeah. and create more, more divide. So... There is a very delicate balance, and I feel like empathy is so important. And being able to talk to people from very different points of views, I'm seeing so much clash and divide between within families, within friend circles. Um, and it's a very hard time right now to be able to get yourself informed because you're only hearing things from a certain perspective. And obviously your, your book is entitled Practical Optimism, and I wonder what the practical advice is here. I mean, you, you talked about the need to, to be happy or, and the urge to be informed. How do we err on the side of happy, and can we do it while being informed? What, what guidelines do you think we should take away from yes. this? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, when it comes to social media to have certain boundaries around it and say, all right, you know, maybe the last hour before bedtime or the first hour of my day, maybe I'll protect my mental space because it is a form of you know, we're ingesting this is our diet. Mm -hmm. How do you want to spend your time? Where do you want to give your time and attention? The other thing about the practical aspect is that we need to empower ourselves through action. You know, so what sort of action can we take? How can we support people? How can we support causes? Can we give back to our community? So like thinking even locally about giving back and self-care is a huge part of it. Like right now, it's okay to have a little distraction. It's okay to have a little levity. It's okay to have a sense of humor. And I appreciated this, the little joke that, you know, Martin was trying to share of how to have brevity in the darkness. And really that's what practical optimism is about, is about not invalidating anyone's experience, not making light of it, um, addressing the collective grief, but also taking care of yourself amidst the darkness. Well, we really appreciate your advice and your guidance here. Dr. Sue Verma, thank you so much. Up next, some Thank of the you. stories we are following here in the United States. We had a big development in the House Speaker race today. Not a new speaker, we don't have that. But Congressman Jim Jordan is out of the race. We have an update on the chaos at the Capitol when we come back. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we are watching tonight. Donald Trump's former attorney, Kenneth Chesbro, pleaded guilty today as part of a sweeping racketeering case against the former president. And he became the second former Trump lawyer to do so in as many days. Chesbro will cooperate with Georgia prosecutors. Yesterday, lawyer Sidney Powell made a similar deal. New dash cam footage shows a Portland man ignoring roadblocks and nearly running over people standing along a parade route. It happened back in June when the driver, 42-year-old Sidney Metcham, pleaded not guilty to 38 counts. Metcham remains in jail. No trial date has been set in this case. Travis King, the Army private who fled to North Korea back in July, has been charged with desertion. In fact, he's been hit with eight counts, including assaulting fellow soldiers and soliciting child pornography. United Auto Workers President Sean Fain says the union can gain more if they hold out longer in contract talks. Each of the big three automakers have offered employee wage increases of 23 percent. But today, Fain said, quote, there is more to be won. Over 30,000 auto workers across more than 20 states have been on strike for about a month. And astronomers have measured a blast of radio waves that took eight billion years to reach Earth. It is hard to get that through my human brain. They are called fast radio bursts, or FRBs, 
The radio wave might have only lasted less than a millisecond, but in that short amount of time, it was powerful enough to release as much energy as the sun puts out over 30 years. Well, the third time was not the charm for Congressman Jim Jordan. After once again failing to secure the votes he needed to win his bid for Speaker of the House, House Republicans voted by secret ballot to remove him as the Speaker nominee. So now, the GOP is back at square one. Here is how former Speaker Kevin McCarthy reacted to the news. We'll have to go back to the drawing board. What history will look at... The crazy eights led by Gates, the amount of damage they have done to this party and to this country is insurmountable. I've never seen this amount of damage done to just a few people for their own personalities, for their own fear of what's going through. And really, um, it's astonishing to me. And um, we are in a very bad position as a party. Joining us now to explain that very bad position, Speaker, former Speaker McCarthy is talking about is NBC's Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali. Ali, whoa. After the third wow. vote, Jordan was still holding out hope here. I mean, what happened? A no good, very bad day for Jim Jordan. And frankly, a bad week and a bad three weeks for the Republican Party. So former Speaker McCarthy there not pulling any punches when he talks about the status of the of the different factions within his conference, but then also of the state of his party and the majority that they hold in Congress right now. For Jim Jordan, after he lost that third balloting vote, continuing to hemorrhage support and adding none, they then went back behind closed doors, huddled once again as a conference, as we have seen them do now multiple times over the course of the last few weeks. And the ask was simple in the room. Uh, members were given a secret ballot. The question on it was, should Jim Jordan remain the speaker designee or should he not? Yes or no? There were more no's than there were yeses, mm. and Jim Jordan had to drop out. Not officially, but he did tell the team inside the room, I will be dropping out. It's been an honor to be your nominee. But now they move on to whoever is next. Well, this is the question, Ali, right? I mean, bids from both Congressman Scalise and Jordan have now failed. I have lost track of the cast of characters here. Is there anyone who can get all the votes needed? Are there literally any front runners at the moment? No. <laughs> And I think that that's why not a lot of us have any optimism for what next week is going to bring. But I'll break it down for you. Everyone who wants to be speaker, and right now there's like 10 names in that mix, and I only imagine that list will grow. But everyone who wants to be speaker has to tell the conference that by 6.30 on Sunday night. Then they'll come back to town Monday evening. They'll start holding their candidate pitch meetings. Everyone will get to go behind closed doors once again, and they'll try to pick a new speaker designate. I think the trouble here, though, Jake, and for anyone watching at home, this may seem hard to believe, but I'm not really sure who, if anyone in this conference, can actually get to the 217 votes needed. And that's not me. That's me saying that, quoting multiple Republican members of Congress mm -hmm. who have said that to me on the record. That's just like the straightest reporting I can give you. Even the conference doesn't think that they could get there. At one point, they were joking that Jesus Christ himself couldn't get 217 votes. And I think they're probably right. Ali Vitale with this chaotic merry-go-round, and you're going to have to be back on board it Monday. Thank oh, you yeah, so much for being you. with us. <laughs> Now, earlier in the show, uh, you heard Ellison Barber and I speaking about President Joe Biden, and she told us that he, when he was asked about whether Israel should delay its impending ground invasion into Gaza in order to facilitate the release of more hostages, we reported that the president said yes. Well, now, at this hour, the White House is clarifying those comments, telling NBC News Biden thought the question was whether he would like to see more hostages released. His answer, of course, was yes. So the White House saying Biden did not reply yes to the ground invasion, but did to the uh, release of additional hostages. Before we go, in a time of war, do ethics just go out the window? And, and is peace actually possible? Well, we're going to get to all of that in our Future of Warfare series. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. They're still finding the bodies of the victims of the Hamas attack over a week ago. The Zaka organization that retrieves the remains of the dead say the latest person to be found at the Kafar Azar kibbutz had been beheaded. There are about 280 bodies, 280 casualties. I would say 80% was tortured. This man lost his brother and his cousin in the blast. His uncle now is in intensive care. This is where he was sitting when it happened. 
People were flying, whole bodies, body parts. There was a guy on fire just here. I was not as upset for my family as I was for that man who was burning in front of me. People were trying to put the flames out. Where are the freedom-loving people? Where are they? The harsh realities and immense human toll of the Israel-Hamas war is playing out in real time in front of all of us. In tonight's edition of The Future of Warfare, we want to talk about the ethics of it all, not just the atrocities and the suffering, but the decisions in future conflicts. Like, will we use autonomous weapons? Is the world ready to accept them? And is there a path for peace anywhere in the near future? Gotti spoke to two experts in the field about all this. Stacey Pettyjohn, a senior fellow and director of the Defense Program at the Center for a New American Security, and Zachary Callenborn, a policy fellow at the Shar School of Public Policy at George Mason University. He's an expert in killer robots and weapons of mass destruction. It's an important conversation. Take a listen. Whether we like it or not, it looks like autonomous drones, lethal drones, and AI are going to be the tip of the spear for the American military going forward. I want to ask, how do you think that's going to play with the American public? I think it's an open question what exactly that means. Um, and a big issue question is going to be how exactly do we square up those things? I think the reality is it's never going to be fully robots on the battlefield because war is fundamentally about human conflict. And uh, because we go to war because we want someone to start doing something or to stop doing something, as we see in Russia. So I think when it comes to the public, I think it mostly is going to be significant in terms of like our attachment to the military because, you know, it's not as much going to be our sons, our daughters, or brothers, sisters who are in harm way, it's going to be these machines that are going to be different. Um, but that doesn't mean there's still sort of a role for service. You know, you still need someone to, say, fly the drones. You need people who are doing logistics, maintenance. And there's still going to be a wide variety of roles for human beings, you know, things like Navy SEALs um, and other types of unconventional roles that, you know, those aren't going to go to the military very soon. So I think it's a change, but I'm not sure it's a drastic one. We've seen, you know, Hollywood paint... Uh... AI as Terminator, right? Uh, and we've seen what happened in the Middle East with some of the Reaper attacks and some of the, the drone strikes there, uh, killing civilians, uh, turning a lot of people away from this type of technology, and, and for good reason. Uh, do you think that when we start to see these systems at scale, uh, we might start seeing the same thing? I mean, I think there is going to be an issue about people trusting these systems, and um, but this may actually inhibit their adoption because there are still going to be soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines that are operating them or responsible. At least the United States is committed to making sure that the humans are making decisions over life or death. And if that's the case, if the system acts in a bizarre way or goes haywire, um, then they might not trust it, which would prevent them from actually using it more fully. Um, but there are going to be issues where systems malfunction or uh, and that can result in life or death. This is going to bleed into not only just warfare, though. You're going to see this when it comes to autonomous cars, right? There can be crashes and people can die. So this whole broader issue of autonomy and how much we give uh, to machines is a big question for society as a whole. You two play in this world a lot more than, than I do and think about these things uh for your job. I got to ask, just looking into this, the question I keep asking myself is, is there any path towards peace in any of this? I mean, the hope is that you figure out how to use weapons in a way in which uh, it's safe and secure and trusted, and that they are just an extension of the military that we have today, and that you use it for deterrence. You know, you're not trying to go out and necessarily uh, change different regimes or attack other countries, but to prevent attacks like we've seen with Russia on Ukraine and make sure that um, sort of the current status quo is upheld and there's peace and stability in the world. So I don't think that necessarily unmanned systems and autonomous systems are going to lead you towards more violence. In some ways, there's been some research done um, by a scholar at MIT that has shown that using unmanned systems results in a reduced pressure to escalate. We've seen this. The U.S. has lost drones over Iran and has not retaliated the way they would have if it were a manned system and a person were captured or killed. So the, there are some good and bad things. You just need to understand uh, the trade-offs and the risks and work to mitigate those. Here's hoping for more peaceful days ahead. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I don't know, I think some level of conflict is always going to be inevitable. And that has less to do with technology and much more to do with people. That is, people are always going to have disagreements over something or 
somewhat, you know, some of those disagreements may be trivial, you know, whether you prefer pineapple on pizza or not. But many of those things are very deep, sacred, fundamental values. If we look at pretty much any political debate um, that we're having in this country right now, it's because people have very different and very critical beliefs about those things, things that they believe to their core are incredibly important. And that's never going to go away. Countries are always going to have that difference. And so some level of conflict, I think, um, is going to always be inevitable. The question is sort of, as Stacey alluded to, how, do, how does it ex escalate? How do we de-escalate? How do we manage it? And how do we figure out where are those real risks that are worth concern, that 10,000 drone swarm? Um, and what do we do about it? I will say there's some optimism that you know there's been a increasing grassroots movement looking at banning autonomous weapons writ large. Uh, I'm not sure a full-scale ban is the right way to go, but I do think militaries do have shared concerns with those activists. Because, you know, that reliability issue I mentioned, that a single pixel change can create a mistake, a soldier doesn't want that either. You know, you don't want to be in the middle of a battlefield having a guy coming at you intent on shooting you and killing you and ha find, oh, my system didn't work. It didn't, you know, it didn't detect this guy. It hit something else. A soldier doesn't want that either. So I think there are some shared pathways here to understand where the real risks are, where these systems can sort of go out of control and, you know, make put controls on them and limit their use. Now, wouldn't it be ironic if the system that we develop to protect us from other humans ends up threatening all humans? Zach, Stacy, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Now, it's been a lot of dark topics tonight, but before we go, we want to leave you with a very special, and I'm talking very special, 60 seconds of joy. You might notice our usual host, Ghani Schwartz, is not here. I've been in his place. Well, he's got a pretty good excuse. Take a look. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, little Rio. Happy birthday to you. I can see him. that? Yeah, this is little Rio right here. Oh, there's your little brother. Oh, oh, that's real Kiki. And just like that, the center of our universe has shifted once again. This is Rio Tadashi Schwartz, our little, little stuff. We can't wait to take him home. And yeah, this right here, that right there, is our future of everything. We'll miss you guys because I am taking some time to just spend as much time as I can with the family. But um, until I'm back, stay tuned. Say bye, Kiki. Say bye. Bye. Say bye, Rio. Bye, Rio. Rio Tagashi Schwartz, born yesterday, seven pounds, four ounces. Let's hope that kid keeps sleeping like he's doing. Both mom and baby are doing well. Gadi, Kimmy, and Kira, who is doing a great job as an older sister, from the whole team here, massive congratulations. We are very, very happy for you. And, you know, Gadi, he, he looks like you. I haven't seen you sleeping, but he does look quite a bit like you. That does it for us tonight. As a result of this great news, you'll probably see me a few more times in the coming days. I'm Jake Ward. We'll see you Monday. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.